I like it. I love it. We went from, okay, we're training 10 kids, we're doing practices, we're preparing for a travel season, we're, we're setting up tournaments, and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, you're not doing any of that. New York State on pause. You must stay in your homes unless not leaving your home endangers a life. Miami's now the epicenter of the pandemic. What word on how, how it's changed? Uncertainty. Challenging. Purpose. I think that my business has to learn how to pivot. If we're going to continue to do this, we've got to continue to evolve. Lost all my income, I've lost camera, I've lost my business. Just seeing, you know, the people that I care about most is me. Is this the right thing to do? And is this the right way to do it? But we have to figure out some type of way to rebound. Green, shine, tornado, hurricane, we're here. Next Step Training is a mindset-driven training program that focuses on life coaching. You're killing them out here, man. You're killing them. Physical and skills training. Good work, good work, good work. And then health and nutrition to get the best of our athletes. We know it's hard and it restricts your movement, but we want it to restrict your movement because we want you to power through it. We actually were right about mid-March uh, when they basically canceled all travel basketball tournaments. And so we knew we were in trouble then. But then we got a glimmer of hope and things started to open back up. Gyms and fitness centers. So effective Monday, gyms uh, can operate. Uh, make sure that you have the respect the social distancing capacity. It seemed like we were trending in the right direction. And then uh, we went the opposite direction. Miami's now the epicenter of the pandemic. What we were seeing in Wuhan six months ago, five months ago, now we are there. We went from, okay, we're training 10 kids, we're doing practices, we're preparing for a travel season, we're, we're setting up tournaments, and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, you're not doing any of that. We started the season with about 60 to 65 clients, and now we're down to about 20. So we've lost a little more than half, and we've lost uh, a few coaches as well. Uh, just because we couldn't sustain the, the money to to pay some of them the salary that they needed and uh, they also moved but we tried to support them as much as we could you you look at us which one do you think is the worst shooter <laughs> it's so important to keep next step going uh, during the pandemic because kids need they need an outlet they need somebody to show them that they're you know their mental you know their their ailments that they're dealing with whether it's depression uh, anxiety uh, you know loneliness that there are certain outlets that will help you get to that and next step is one of them because we want to have real conversations with our kids we want them to know that you know it's it's okay to have these feelings but it's not okay not to do anything about them to have a bookstore but I thought this was going to happen years and years and years like I'd retire into it but what started off as like a whisper uh, got louder and louder and louder and became at some point a scream <laughs> Janine A. Cook. I am, I call myself the shopkeeper of Harriet's Bookshop in the Fishtown section of Philadelphia. So Harriet's Bookshop is named for historic heroine Harriet Tubman. And our mission is to celebrate women authors, women artists, women activists. Toni Morrison, but she has a quote, and I'm going to butcher it because I'm no good at, as, I'm nowhere as good as she is, but she says, you know, if there is a book that you want to read and you can't find it, it might mean that you need to write that book. And that's the same thing 
with the bookstore. Like, I'd never been in a bookstore that really just focused and celebrated women, especially black women. And that, you know, I'd never been in a bookstore, which is a children's section, where you see brown children on almost all of the covers of the books. You know, they people are like, oh, that's corny. Like, nobody, what are, men are not gonna shop there. Men aren't gonna give you their money. Like, if, why would you be so specific? What about white people? You know, I never said that we were exclusive or that there was someone who couldn't come in here. All we're doing, the mission is to celebrate women, women authors, women artists, women activists. And um, not knowing that, you know, fast forward a few months, everything that would happen with George Floyd's murder and with Breonna, Breonna Taylor's murder would, would occur and that it would be even more essential socially for people to understand their ignorance around um, certain topics. A bar or restaurant that is violating these rules can lose their liquor license. And it is not the time to forge ahead with indoor dining. But it is the time to double down on outdoor dining. The bad ones who are exploiting the situation and breaking the law, by the way. This is not just morality, they're breaking the law. Are going to make it bad for everyone. And so far, we have 6,600 restaurants that have taken advantage of our open restaurants initiative. Brooklyn Chop House came for me because I come from a Greek diner background, and the last 15 years, I've owned Chinese restaurants. And what I've done with that is I've married my two favorite cuisines, an American steakhouse, taking sandwiches from the classic diner and making them into dumplings, and then surrounding it with what I call is LSD. At Brooklyn Chop House, you get salt and pepper to your lobster. You get the dry-aged porterhouse steak. It's Americana, a little salt, that's it. And then you got a Peking duck or Beijing chicken all on table. So when COVID hit, we didn't have a business anymore. We're really not a delivery business, takeout business, but I said that that's not enough. We need to make a more of an impact. So we started doing the meals for the hospitals. New York Presbyterian was about two blocks away. So we wanted to give back to them and we just started sending them meals every night. They didn't even know it was coming. We just started sending it over 20, 30 portions. We didn't refuse one request and we got up to 18 hospitals and police departments. We went over 8,300 meals in three months. The hardest part of this pandemic has been seeing the pain that has been caused to our staff. Morale was down to zero. And then once the hospitals started to really go strong by the end of March, I could see everybody was uplifting. All the nurses and doctors and janitorial and maid staff, everyone in the hospital started putting stuff on Instagram. They put one thing that was 20 feet long with literally 40 members holding it with a big thank you. And my staff was just like, wow, that is so cool. And I said, look, you know, we are making an impact, a positive impact. It's not all about making money or losing money or whatever it is. It's about what can we do to give back, especially the ones that are keeping us alive. Yeah, I like the way you did it. Good. A lot of our kids during this time are going crazy. <laughs> They've been messaging us nonstop. You know, what are you guys doing? Can we go out and do the hills again? So it's, it's been a huge adjustment. Let's stop. Grab again. Push again. Coaching during this time has been uh, challenging. Challenging in the sense that you want to make sure that you're doing the right thing from a safety standpoint. And since the knowledge of, of what's going on is changing on a daily basis, yeah, you just want to make sure you're always doing the right thing. It's hot in here. It's hot in here. It's hot. We try to stay pretty consistent with the um, the guidelines from the CDC. So uh, we're wearing masks. We're keeping six feet apart. Uh, when we're outdoors, we just make sure that we, we take it even more. We try to be even more than six feet apart. Uh, we're washing our hands after drills. Uh, during drills, we will have uh, hand sanitizer there if they would like. And when we're not, there's no contact. So we're not doing any one-on-one -on -one drills, uh, where there's a chance, uh, where they're, they're constantly touching each other. Just like, yay, you look just, <laughs> just like the bearded one. <laughs> good footwork, good footwork. That's what we gotta deal with these days, man. How do you teach kids that, man? That's just tough. Unfortunately, some of our full-time coaches 
Um, you know, they had to go get regular, you know, regular paying jobs because we couldn't afford to pay them. And uh, we, we did apply for some of the loans and unfortunately, you know, we weren't able to get them. It's been a lot, but uh, like like all of us, we're, we're going to get through it. This is a bump in the road and, um, you know, you just have to take your licks and keep on going. We knew we officially wanted to open on February 1st, which is considered to be Freedom Day, but also like marks the beginning of Black History Month. Um, and I think we were bringing a vibrancy to the to the to the block, to the community, um, and being in a lot of ways unapologetically Black, right? And being in a lot of ways unapologetically woman. That was what was exciting to me. And then six weeks later, we were told we needed to shut down. I am issuing a stay-at-home order for six more counties right now. You must stay in your homes unless not leaving your home endangers a life. And then I think I went into a little bit of a depression. I wasn't eligible for PPP and all of the other like things that, uh, all the loans that were flying around, I wasn't really eligible for them. I'm super small and still was, you know, had a lot of like folks like, you know, you can do it. And then we did switch things to online and open the online store. So I think that as a woman, as a black woman specifically, I've, I've lived the life of like, adapt, adapt, move on, figure it out, figure it out, catch up. You don't understand that? Figure it out, you know? And so I have been doing that my entire life. Breaking tonight, peaceful demonstrations turning violent in Philadelphia. Unfortunately, I think after what happened with George Floyd, people had a huge rec reckoning um, with their ignorance and where do you go when you're ignorant? If you're smart, you go to a book. You know, I hope it's not a trend. I hope it's not just like, you know, something that makes people feel good in the moment and then they return to their, um, you know, old ways. Especially in a neighborhood like Fishtown, this is what it's needed. You need to see a black face. It's okay that that I'm here and that I'm taking up space and that I'm making noise. I bring a DJ out there. <laughs> you know, I just I, I I make noise because you know for far too long this neighborhood has been able to hide itself in its ignorance and not really face it. A woman told me, she was like, oh, I got to think about Harriet Tubman every time I come past here. And, and then I got to think about slavery. Yes, you do have to think about that. Yup. Yup. You know, because you know who else got to think about it? At me. You know what I mean? And so, you know, congratulations. Welcome. The bad restaurant and bar owners are going to make it worse for the good ones. It was totally chaos packed. We cannot go ahead with indoor dining in New York City. We are literally doing exactly what you want us to do. We're struggling. We don't know half of the things. Every single day they have new rules. We're stuck. We don't know what to do. So the city and the government gave us a 12-step reopening plan. With my team and I, we created 40 steps. I'll tell you some of them that are a little bit from left field. Or if we took chemical strips, and we put them all over the surfaces of the restaurant. When they turn a dark brown, that means that there's not enough disinfectant on the uh, surfaces. Uh, when they turn blue, that means they've been disinfected. So this is the area the city gave us for an outdoor deck. But the, the issue we have is the street goes down. So we're building an actual deck to level it off. And then we're putting a massive divider up and we'll have up to a 75 seat. Second deck is open. I like the middle, I like the middle. The white one's down the middle. Great added safety. And then we have the facial coverings that go down. Anyone that touches food has to wear a fishing cap and has a shield that goes down to the breastbone. The body thermoscanner scanner for entrance takes your temperature automatically without putting a gun to your head, uh, which I think is a, a little intrusive. I, you know, high reservation report. Can I see your forehead? The body thermo scanner. What does it say? Pass. Pass, yes. I don't if you're over 99.7, you won't be allowed in the restaurant. Someone said to me, how dare you put the metal detector into a thermometer and, and encringe on my civil rights? 
I said, you know, I've seen this thing firsthand. And besides my own daughter, um, I actually saw body bags at one of our deliveries at Elmer's Hospital. When I saw black bags on the floor, I, 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 I didn't think that those were bodies, and they were. And my staff had a really hard time with that. When you think about stuff like that, you know, finances and all that thing come are a far second. So people ask me, so you did 40 things to protect us during COVID. How many will remain when there's a vaccine? I am going to keep 80 to 90 percent of what we're doing now in place post-vaccine because it's common sense and we should have been doing it before.